Hi, I'm Craig, and I want to tell you about the Activated Classroom. I want to talk about rethinking our classroom. I recently had an opportunity to, to travel beautiful South Africa, and I, and I got to work in some amazing places, like you can see here, sitting in the beautiful flowers of Namakwaland, and starting to think to myself, are we doing our teaching right and, and reflecting on, on the many years that I've been involved with teaching and using technology in the classroom? For a long time, I've been trying to understand how do our students learn in online worlds? And, and we've even created amazing things like this. Online spaces that are, are, are digital replications of the real world. We've created lecture theatres and libraries and explored social media spaces from Twitter to, to Facebook to all these incredible things. Yet over and over again, I'm not sure that I'm getting it right because it just doesn't seem to be working. There's one thing that's without doubt. And that is that we live in a changing world. I mean, we take a look at this picture here. Taken back in 2005 in St. Peter's, Rome. Fast forward a few years and what do we get? Look at that. A few years later and it's a totally different image of the same place. This is the world that we live in now. All of a sudden, things are different. We see our world through the lens of an iPhone and tablet. Things have changed. And if they've changed for us, how have they changed for our students? And how are they changing in our classroom? There's no doubt that technology is everywhere. It's changing our world. In fact, uh, recent research had a look at what the digital or the daily diet is of a student, of our teens. And they found that, well, they're spending less than an hour on exercise, maybe not surprising. They're spending about six hours at school. They're spending seven hours sleeping. But most surprisingly, the average teen in his day is spending nine hours on technology. That's more time on technology than on sleeping. What sort of impact is it having on them? If sleep has an impact on how our minds work and how they're programmed and how we learn, what impact is technology having on our modern student? But I need to ask you a big question. Technology is great, but is technology the solution? Do you trust technology? Well, when I ask that question often in a seminar, I get two types of answers, obviously. The one group saying, oh, definitely. The other group saying, no. Well, we're stupid to trust it totally. Every time you, you trust it, it tends to let you down. But equally, you wouldn't be watching this if it wasn't for technology. You wouldn't be driving in your car. You wouldn't be in an aeroplane if it wasn't for technology. We have to trust it. Is it the solution? Take a look at this. Emma. Huh? Emma. 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 Nouveau de trèfle maxi faille, vraiment plus large. Okay. So technology is great, but it's not the solution to everything, is it? It has its limits. The bottom line is technology is here to stay. It's changing our lives. It's not the answer to everything, but there is no doubt that it's impacting our society. It's impacting our everyday life. It's impacting business and it's impacting our classroom. But there's a problem. You see, as I try to use technology in the classroom over the last 15 to 20 years, over and over again, I'm a little slow learner. It just didn't seem to be working like I expected. And it's slowly dawning on me that there's a problem. But the problem is, is so obvious that I just couldn't see it. Now, if you're anything like me, I don't know if it's the same for you, but sometimes when something is so obvious, I just don't see it like this. What's the mistake here? What's the problem here? You're looking at it and you say, well, I can't see. I'm looking at the numbers and the colors. And often we overanalyze it when you miss the obvious. Can you see what's wrong here? Yeah, got it? Now, if you're one of the brighter ones out there, you're like, I got it, got it, got it, I know what it is. And you're like, hoo, hoo, hoo. dance, dance, celebrate. 
And the poor guy next to you, who's Mr. Average, like me, and you're like, oh, man, what's that? Come on, he's sure, Randy. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The mistake's so obvious we can't see it. Read carefully. Can you find the, the mistake? There it is. You go, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, why did I see it? You see, that's what things are like when it comes to educational technology. The mistake that we are making in the classroom is so obvious we don't see it. And, and I couldn't see it. You know what? I looked at my lecture theatres and thought, you know what, we need to create a digital equivalent of this. And I took the lecture theatre, I copied it, and I pasted it into a digital world. And I had this beautiful online 3D virtual lecture theatre, and I got my students, and I said, come on, guys, get inside here. And they all brought their little avatars, and we made our way inside here. And we sat down on a chair, absolutely fantastic. Well... It took them about 20 minutes to get their little avatar into the, the right spot and then had to hover it so they could see the slides. And I'll say, okay, guys, let's start. Now, this is all done with text. Slide number one coming up. And they all typing this text everywhere and eventually this slow slide goes, boom. And it's like, oh, okay. And this slide is explaining the basic principles of slide number two coming. 30 seconds later, boom. I got through about four slides was the end of our one hour session. And I'm thinking, what? You know what, I might as well have just emailed in the slides. This is achieving nothing. It's worse than just emailing in the slides. But we don't stop there. We take blackboards and you say, know what? Let's copy a blackboard and we're going to go digital and we got a smart board. What's changed? It's nothing. It's exactly the same. Our students are still just passively sitting there. In fact, most people don't even bother plugging in the smart board. Ah, my personal favorite. We don't have books at our schools. We've got e-books. Oh, wow, even got the little curling pages and everything. They just like the old traditional counterpart. I'm not saying books are wrong. I'm saying nothing has changed. A book or an e-book, pedagogically speaking, how we teach is exactly the same thing. And then my favorite, ah, oh, you know what? We're a modern school. We don't have teachers. We've got YouTube videos. We record the teachers, stick them in a video, and we think things have changed. Nothing's different. It's still instruction. And so all of these changes, these copy paste that are taking place is an illusion. Now watch this. I'm going to do this. And I know this has taken me years to master this. I'm going to do this trick through the lens of the camera all the way to where you're watching. Now, as I said, this is taking a long time to get right. Now, what I need you to do, just focus, because I need you to get in sync with me now. I want you, without telling anyone, definitely not me, Okay, you can't do, you know, you can't do that. I want you to choose a card. Now, keep it to yourself. Keep it to yourself in your mind. And now focus on that card. Focus on that card. Keep focusing on that card. Now, you've got a card in your mind. Yes, yes. Got it. Your card has gone. It's gone. It's gone. I manipulated you to choose the card I wanted. And it's gone. I removed your card from those six cards. That is mind control. And you're probably looking around like, hey, hey, what's he doing, man? How's he doing this? He's in my head. He's in my, get out of my head. Okay, I'm not in your head. It's not mind control. It's an illusion. That's what illusionists do. In fact, if you looked very carefully, all six cards changed. It's an illusion of change. You, for, a, for a while, you're like, wow, this is amazing. And it's like, ah, oh, yeah, oh, they will change. Yeah. That's what chicks are. The trick is just an illusion. And that's exactly what's happening with our educational technology in the classroom. It's an illusion of change. We think we're changing when nothing's changed. It's just a silicon coating on the old traditions. And so, what's happening? All around us, we're seeing increasing reports of failure and failure and failure. More and more, the headlines are being filled. Los Angeles cancels its iPad program. Why educational technology has failed. Lessons from the downfall of interactive whiteboards. Why schools shouldn't be using laptops. What's going on? What is going on? Why are we seeing so many reports of failures, but then other times you see, no, it's great. Technology is great to the classroom. It's making a huge difference. I don't get it. Why are we seeing failure and success? What's wrong? What's going wrong? You see, when things are failing, do we want to follow after the failures? And that's my worry. 
we get so excited with the educational technology, even if the reports are saying it's not working, we still want to do it. We carry on doing the same things over and over again. As Albert Einstein once said, insanity is doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results. If it's not working in Los Angeles, and then it's not working in London, then it's not working in Sydney and Cape Town, why do we think it's going to work for us? If we carry on doing the same thing. So the question we need to answer is what's going wrong? Is it the technology that's the problem? Is it the teachers that are a problem? What's the problem? Because technology seems to be working in business. Why is it not working effectively in schools? So you see, something's missing. There's a formula. A great teacher plus great technology should really equal great teaching. So where's the blame line? And, I, and I've seen countless teachers ask this question when it doesn't work and management at schools saying, what's wrong? Is it Apple's beautiful iPad? Surely it can't be. Is it the teacher? Well, she's one of the best teachers we have. There is a model called the TPAT model that, that tries to understand what are the aspects, what are the components that are necessary for us to use technology in our teaching? And so how, how do we move from what might be called classroom 1.0 to classroom 2.0, from a traditional classroom to a technology classroom? Well, there's three things we need. Number one is technical knowledge. Now, increasingly, we have that. Uh, even as teachers, we, we know how to use the software. We know how to use the tablet or the smartphone or the laptop or the netbook, we're understanding that. And equally, we understand our content. I know my subject, geography or history or maths or English. What's missing? The thing in the middle is a pedagogy. That is the missing component. It's like, I had this little kid recently, he was so enthusiastic, he, he, he wanted to be involved in cooking. And his parents had this great kitchen. I had a fantastic stove and one of these big blender things. And he was like, wow, he's going to do it. And so he went in there full blast and he took the stuff and he put all the stuff in the blender and, and then stuck it in this fancy oven and cranked it up and waited the 30 minutes and pulled it out. And whoa, disaster, not soft spongy cake, rock cake. Didn't work. The bottom line here, missed out some of the essential ingredients like baking powder. You see, he did not have a recipe. He could have been enthusiastic as he liked. He could have had the greatest technology. Without the recipe, he would not succeed. And that's the missing element when it comes to educational technology and using technology effectively in the classroom. What is the pedagogy? And this is what struck me. I spent all these years trying so many exciting things new environments, new platforms, new tools. And over and over again, it just didn't seem to work. My students were like, ah, eh, borrowing, or, oh, it's not working, or I don't like this. And I'm thinking, what's going on? And so I finally realized I needed to go to where they live. And so for my PhD, I, I used the F word. There's a certain word you don't use with learning in the same sentence, Facebook. Learning, those are not the same things. Well, it actually depends what you mean by learning. Facebook has fundamentally changed how we do things. With over one and a half billion users as a social network, it's changed things. It's influences beyond Facebook because things like YouTube and Twitter and all of these things, the same genre of social network, have changed how we connect, how we communicate, how we create. It's changed how we do things and it's changed how our students are learning. And so I went into Facebook and had to swim around this digital world for, for months, gathering thousands and thousands of pages of transcripts. And out of that, my mission was to understand how is learning taking place in this new world? And can we identify a pedagogy that would help us? Well, one of the things that struck me after going through all of this process was that there are four potential ways in which we can use technology in the classroom. And I developed this very simple model. So what I'd like you to do is just for a moment, Think about your classroom. And this is an educational technology assessment model. It's about reflecting on your teaching in your classroom. And there are two dimensions to it. The one dimension is the content dimension. Is it around consumption or content production? And the other dimension is the learning dimension. Is the learning passive or is it active? So this means that we can end up with four possibilities. You could have a classroom where your students are passive consumers. Alternatively, they could be active consumers, passive producers, 
or the objective, the goal, active producers. Now, let me give you an example. Typically, when one of the most common implementations of technology in the classroom are videos, YouTube videos or, or eBooks. This is passive consumption. You see, nothing has changed when we use YouTube videos or eBooks, as we said earlier. Our students are still passively involved in the learning process and they are consuming content, not producing. Well, sometimes we realize that and we say, no, we've got to do better than that. And so maybe we get them to, to use apps or play some games. Yeah, they're active, but at the end of that process, nothing is produced. Or maybe we say, no, no, what about smart boards? You, you see, with smart boards, stuff is being produced, but typically the student's still very passive. What we want are students who are active producers. When you look at how they use social media and how they're engaging online, all the time, sitting there thinking, selfie, ooh, selfie, ooh. hey, doing little videos, creating things, sharing things, posting things, liking things. They are actively producing content. That's what we want to do in our teaching. And so the question is, how do we bring all of these great tools and move them to that quadrant? We need the recipe. We need a pedagogy that will allow us to move into the active producing quadrant. And that's what has emerged from my research. And, and it's a pedagogy that is really simple to follow. It's a recipe that we can use for any technology, but it makes us focus on the teaching before the technology. And it basically is a model that starts from very low activated classroom and tries to move our students through layers to right at the top, the highly activated classroom. Now the bottom layer is the layer of consumption. I don't even have to tell you about that because we all know what consumption is. Consumption-based teaching is something we've been doing for years where our students, they sit in the rows there, normally with the head slightly to the side, and we talk at them. Sort of what we're doing now, unfortunately. I'm going to tell you what we can do about that in a moment. Consumption-based teaching is sitting and listening, and we've done it for years and years and centuries. But we want to move away from that because technology allows us to change this thing totally. And so the layers of the model move from consumption to curation to conversation to correction, to creation and chaos. And as the students move up these layers, as we go through these different pedagogies, these different teaching approaches, the students are more engaged, they're more activated, the brain cognitively gets more challenged and they are producing content, they are producing artifacts that are so powerful in the learning process. And so we need a mind shift. Now this is not always easy to change our perspective, especially when we've been doing something for so long in the same way. These are the mind shifts that the activated classroom model needs us to make. So let's start with the lowest layer, the layer of curation. See, why do we want to teach our students with pre-packaged content? You know what it's like. We're going to be learning about the final battle of World War II students. Here, read chapter 2, 3, and 4. Why do we want to do that? When we could get them to curate their own content. There's so much great technology that allows our students to start pulling stuff together because in curating, there is thinking, there is synthesis, there is analysis, there is categorization. The brain is invoked, the brain is thinking. Take, take a look at this. You recognize it? It's the Sistine Chapel. Why, why have I got it here? Because it's an example of curation. These are all Bible stories that have been pulled together and, and put in certain sequences. It's curation. In fact, every day when you wake up, the very first thing you do is curation. Do you know what it is? It's the very first thing, well, one of the very first things, maybe you open your eyes and have a cup of coffee. But one of the first things you do is you get up and you open your cupboard and, whew, I don't know, maybe if you're a lady, you've got like 4,000 dresses. And if you're a guy, you've got 2,000 gray suits. Well, then it's not, that's easy. But whatever it is, you've got all of these items of clothing. And you've got to choose that goes with that. I think I'll wear it with that. That process, the process of thinking, of analyzing, of categorizing, and it is so powerful. And we see it all the time. You see, we don't like to use our brains. And so there'll be a magazine that comes out and says, these are the top five you know, best apps, or these are the top three holiday destinations. Okay, so I'm going to ask you, if I had to ask you right now, what would you say are your top three holiday destinations in the world? You can go anywhere. Three places in the world, you've got a ticket that allow you to go to three places, where would you go? Think about it for a moment. Your brain's going, oh man, I don't know, there's so many, there's so many, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Well, well if I put them up all of a sudden, you go Cape Town, Bali, Paris, you know, I don't have to think, you can just, well, maybe. You see, as soon as you have to pull from all of this, 
Our brain is activated and technology allows our students to do this. Every time they're using social media and liking something, sharing something, choosing what to read, what not to read, that is a process of curation. They are always curating and it is such a powerful pedagogy. Let's go up a layer, a layer of conversation. Why do we want to educate our students through passive instruction where we talk at them like we're doing now, when we can allow them to engage in learning through conversation? That is the essence of our digital age. Think about social media, social media. It's all about conversation. That's what Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google, all these things are about conversations. And conversation is such a powerful pedagogy. The technology supports it. And it allows us to change how we learn, how we teach. And I love this little example here. If you look here, you can see comments that other people have made. You highlight a line and then you say comment. And you can see all the other comments people have made about it. My friend Liz actually just annotated on the same line that I did. Um, the last line, uh, I tell you why I must risk everything for the raw recipe of our passion. Um, she had a similar interest in the line, how um, it comes together and the meaning of the poem really comes together at the end. So that was probably my favorite line of this poem. Right, that's a great example of conversation. They're having a conversation around a poem. They're using technology to have a conversation. Online conversations are so powerful because all of a sudden the barriers are no longer there. There's no longer this, I'm afraid to talk. And conversation is one of the most powerful pedagogies that we can apply in our classroom. Well, let's go up a layer. And as we go up a layer, these things become a little bit more challenging cognitively. We're in a world where we are obsessed with things being correct. It's right and wrong. You've done the test. This is how it's done. Your technology and the modern world is not like that. It's a world about correcting, where we are constantly improving. Take this presentation. It didn't suddenly appear like this. There were five slides, 10 slides, then there were 20 slides, then I edited those, and there were 17 slides. Or, or when you write something, you, you write a letter or you write a document. It, it's not right the first time. You edit it and you edit it. Because why? Because learning happens in mistakes. And technology allows us to encourage that. It's okay to make a mistake. Learn through it. And so students can work together. That's the wiki world we live in. What's a wiki? A wiki is this ongoing thing that is constantly correcting itself. And it's so powerful. The pedagogy of correcting. When we start to use tools like wikis and others like Google Docs that allow us to encourage our students to learn through correcting, we are engaging them in one of the most powerful learning approaches that is possible in our digital world. And so we move up and we're getting higher and higher. And as we get to these higher layers, it starts to get more and more powerful and it starts to get more and more active as we hit the layer of creation. We want to mind shift. Not from our students just consuming content, which invariably ends up going sleeping. Why do we want them to consume the content or the video when they can create it? Technology is so amazing, whether you're creating an animation, a cartoon, or even a video. I love this as an example of creating. We're living in a world that is increasingly starting to communicate through video, just like this. And it's getting easier. All the time I see my students like selfie, woo, ah, he, ah, how do I look? They love taking photos, they love taking videos. Fantastic. Let's use that love and that passion for creating and build it into a pedagogy of our classroom. You see, rather than watching the video, they create the video. I'll give you an example. I've had my students and they were doing some topics that were so dry and boring. I was like, oh, I can't handle it. I'm going to have to teach it to you again. I thought, well, why would I do that? I'm going to tell you what, I want you guys to make a video that explains this really complex topic in an innovative way. And it was amazing how creative they became. But even better than that, at the end of it, when the video is finished, we all go hand out popcorn, stick the class in, the, in one room, and we start to watch the videos together. And there's laughter and there's fun, but there's learning. The learning carries on because we can now look at the artifact that has been produced and we can assess it and the metaphors that have been used. What a powerful pedagogy for learning. You see, creating is something that starts when we're children, building little Lego things, and all of a sudden as we get into the classroom, into school, it falls by the wayside, yet it's such a powerful pedagogy. And I love this example. Take a look at this. Chemistry. I'm a chemistry jock. That's a video creative. I'm chemistry. I'm a chemistry jock. I'm a chemistry jock. 
I'm a chemistry uh, She's got a bending ring She needs to alkylate I push those arrows, draw some bonds in my transition state Cause I'm wondrous When I synthesize I use a strong base Open epoxides Do I hate water? No But I love to watch it leave I quench that charge with a bond Maybe two or three And I hear people say Man, I love your scheme A mechanism fiend I synthesize with ease Hey, I can see you starting to cool. You get into it. Isn't that amazing? They created a song out of something quite abstract. They had to think about this content. They had to condense it into some sort of script, or in this case, a song. Creating is one of the most powerful pedagogies that we could use, and that is one of the highest layers of the activated classroom. And now we move up to the next layer. You look at this, a whole lot of like panda bears. What's the deal? You see, sometimes. In the chaos of seemingly nothing around us, we miss what's actually there. This is what we're called on to do all the time. C can you see something in this? If you look carefully, you'll actually see there is a person standing here. He's a famous artist. He paints himself into the pictures, the same color as his background. It's amazing. What's the point? The point is that hidden in this seeming randomness, in this chaos, there is something. And this is something we are called to do all the time in the modern world. It's the realm of chaos. Learning through the pedagogy of chaos. And I'm not talking about your, your students hanging from the ceilings and running around screaming and overturning the desks. I'm talking about switching from a control mindset to a mindset of learning through chaos. Because that's the world we live in. Formulas don't work. We, we give them formulas at school and they go out to life and there's too much information, there's conflicting information, there's missing information. How do we teach our students to take all of the seeming randomness, all of the seeming confusion, all of this information overload and pull out of it sense and meaning? Because that's what learning is about in the modern age. It's not regurgitation, it's meaning making, it's sense making. And that is a vital skill and an incredibly powerful pedagogy. So rather than just give our students the facts, we give them lots of facts and it's confusing and there's bits of missing facts and we say, what do you see here? Using great tools, for example, maybe like a mind map. Pull meaning out of this. And this is the highest level and it's not easy. But when we get to this layer and we use the layer of chaos, of pedagogy of chaos, what an incredible impact it has on our classroom and how activated our students become in the learning process. And so those are the layers of the activated model. But where does it leave you? Well, the bottom line is we call it educational technology, but maybe we shouldn't because more often than not, I see exactly the opposite in the classroom. The cart before the horse, because we put technology before education. It shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be some vendor arriving on the scene and saying, oh, I've got technology solution. Here are the latest piece of, of tablet or of laptop. And we go, wow, thank you, Mr. Technology person. This makes no sense. Why are we being led by technology people as educationalists. I mean, would you get like a, an electrician arriving in a restaurant and telling the chef how to cook or, or vice versa? No, then why are we being led by technology? There are three aspects we've really seen before, education, technology, and the third is pedagogy. We've got to get that right. And so it's education, then technology. It's pedagogy, then technology. And that is the most important thing. Focus on how we teach. The tools are all there. Then we can get it right. So I invite you to be part of this exciting new journey as we activate our classrooms and transform how we teach with technology. Thank you for listening.